Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming, the Ozren Woods, Day 12. The woods really are the queer purple colour that I was told. The trees don't look particularly strange in any other way, but the leaves and even the bark range from a bluish red to a deep violet. The branches are alive with birds of all kinds and colours. I almost expected them to be purple as well, but none are. Day 14. The fruit of these trees is delightful. I am already wondering if I can carry a sack of them back with me to Oxfon. I think Hela could make some extraordinary wine from these. Day 15. I feel unwell, but I plan to leave for home tomorrow nevertheless. Day 16. Too sick to leave today. Day 17. Still very ill. I can't help but notice that none of the wildlife eats the fruit of the trees. My gut is covered in bruise like sores, very tender to the touch. Day 19. The sores on my gut have formed distinct growths. I still can barely stand. The food I brought with me is gone. Only the purple fruit to eat. Despite the pain in my stomach, I am filled with hunger. Day 20. The growths are... longer. I cannot move except to crawl, and barely that. Day 22. Dear lords of my ancestors, help me. The growths, as long as serpents, have begun to burrow into the soil around me. I tried to cut one of them, but the pain increased past beyond that which I could stand, still so weak. Tomorrow I will try again. Here the journal of Temelus crossed ends. The Ozren woods are a large forest of purple trees that grow nowhere else. Do not eat the fruit of these trees. Numenera. You know, I usually start my reviews with a piece of fiction that I've created for the setting. I like to get the people watching into the game through a little bit of prose. And yet, wow. You know, I'm not particularly prone to exaggeration. And I have been completely blown away. Honestly. No word of exaggeration or a lie. I have not been so impressed with a setting since I first came across Planescape and Wraith the Oblivion. Numenera is, to me, a revolution in the fantasy genre. It stars itself as the science fantasy genre, and I think I can get behind that. But it has blown me away. It has completely blown me away. You know, it's a rarity that I will read every single word in a role-playing game, especially one as thick as this, 400-odd pages. You know, because some role-playing games are set out like encyclopedias. Uh, some role-playing games are not set out to be easy to read. And while in the past I will have read The Player's Handbook and The Dungeon Master's Guide, and when I was first getting into role-playing and I read every single table, every single skill, every single feat, those days have long gone. Even in the World of Darkness games that I profess to adore, I don't read every single discipline power that exists. Yet, the reason I have taken my time coming to review Numenera is because I have read every single word in this book. It is fantastic, and I know the review hasn't even started properly yet. This is, I'm going. My words are going to have to match up to my initial claims. What is Numenera? Well, it is the ninth world, the ninth incarnation of planet Earth, or the ninth incarnation of humankind. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that there have been eight Earths before this one. It doesn't mean the planet has been blown up and reconstituted. It doesn't mean that it's a whole new race of humanity, although it may well be. But if you imagine that over several hundred billion years, Earth has somehow persisted, humankind has somehow persisted, and each gap between each epoch of humanity, I suppose, each era of humanity, seems to have forgotten about the last. Now, what do these generations of humanity do? What great heights did they reach? And why did they disappear? Did the first group ascend to some, well, transmorphed state? Did another venture off into the galaxy and never return? Has another 
wiped itself out completely through nuclear holocaust? Have others mutated beyond anything resembling human? It is impossible to tell, except the ninth world knows that it is the ninth world. And how does it know this? Because the remnants of the previous eight are there, buried in the earth, but also on the surface, technology that humans do not understand, and the fine line between magic and science being so utterly thin that in this world, in the ninth world, you could get a job as essentially a hedge wizard as well as you could a great scientist and probably claim the same feats of wonderment as one another. How has the Earth not been destroyed? Well, it is alluded to that maybe one of the previous incarnations of humanity was actually able to control the sun. Another was somehow perhaps able to move the Earth out of its natural orbit of the sun. But all we know right now is that the solar system exists as it exists for us, minus Mercury. But the ninth incarnation know nothing about Mercury because it must have disappeared somewhere prior to the ninth world. And what does the Ninth World constitute? Well, as well as being a great big rubble-strewn archaeological wasteland come treasure map, it is part post-apocalyptic, past well, fields of wonder, great tombs to be raided, castles to be discovered, entire lands and civilizations that have not yet been trod upon by human feet. It is a Pangaea-like continent. At some point or other in Earth's past, the land masses have coalesced, surrounded by masses of ocean, of course. And the structures that exist, some of them are the mountains and jungles, the hills, the valleys, the seas that you would expect to see on a planet roughly approximate to Earth. But others are, well, mountains made out of glass, trees made out of metal, houses being made out of synth. A lot of these structures have not been built by the inhabitants of the Ninth World. A lot of them have just been occupied by the inhabitants of the Ninth World. They've just come across a completely abandoned town. Who knows when it was abandoned? How? Who knows how this was constructed? Because no one seems to have the technology to create these things again. And yet somehow this city is balanced precariously atop an inverted pyramid, and yet it never teeters, it never topples. Something is keeping that pyramid in place. In another place, the amorphous fields, the ground constantly roils and tumults as if there is something organic living beneath it. Occasionally it spews out our natural gases, and gigantic jellyfish-like creatures, cephalopods, that go floating around until they just disappear back into the earth. And the only way people can live above these amorphous fields are in floating towns, or towns that, towns that are chained to the few solid masses in the amorphous fields. The divided seas in the Ninth World are split. One, a vast salt water sea, another completely fresh water, and despite the fact that the two seas are connected, there is no dividing point, and despite the fact it is freshwater rivers that fall in, flow into the sea of salt water, Somehow, the two do not intrude on one another. How is that the case? The city of bridges that stretches out into the ocean. 20,000 people live there. Piers, scaffolding, girders, great metal sheets stretching deep out into the ocean with towns, with homesteads, with workshops, with churches and temples and all kinds of things just stretched across it. A wholly innovative city that may not have been built by the Ninth World but may have been discovered by the Ninth World. There is so much to this setting and none of the animals, none of the monsters are the things you would typically find in a fantasy world. There's no orcs, there's no elves, there's no dwarves. And the things that could pass for the mammals and reptiles and so on that we know, the species that we know of Earth, are slightly different. Perhaps they're mutated in some way, perhaps they're just larger, but they are all very much slightly different. The bestiary in this game is impressive, it is captivating, it just stokes the fires of the imagination, and the setting itself just 
completely inflames my creativity. It makes me want to run this game. It makes me want to play this game. It makes me want to write for this game. Numenera is just a game that gets inside my head and makes me want to start putting pen to paper. And so many fantasy settings just struggle to do that now. I sometimes struggle with Shadowrun specifically as that science and fantasy hybrid because I find it shoehorned together a bit too conveniently and Numenera gets that blend completely right in my opinion. I find this just such an excellent amalgamation and I know I'm waxing about this terribly and I'm not quite reviewing it yet beyond giving it a synopsis and we've already passed the 10 minute mark but I need to convey to you that this game is unlike anything I have ever read, it is unlike anything I have ever run before, and good lord I do want to play it, because the the adventures you could have in the Ninth World, uh, beyond just the, the limitations of fantasy, and I know fantasy has no limitations, but so many fantasy worlds are carbon copies of each other, whether we like it or not, with Tolkien-esque influences, this is just wholly new. Uh, and you can see the influences of Planescape, you can see the influences of other fantasy settings, of almost a Fallout-like uh, setting. Uh, to be honest, the campaign setting, the world that I compare Numenera most closely to, is Stalker, because of that idea that you could walk out of your door, you could walk across those fields and you could encounter something you've never seen before and the environment could completely destroy you, the iron winds could completely mutate you if they pass through, you could encounter a monster that's never been seen before, you could encounter a sinkhole and an entire tunnel complex that's lined with pipes, belching steam, filled with ciphers, filled with the Numenera, the Numenera being the artefacts of the previous eight worlds that the ninth world humans are only just starting to harness, only just starting to be able to use. And those people who are destined to discover this Numenera are your player characters. So as you get onto the system, the way this game by Monty Cook and Shana Germain and Monty Cook Games, before I go any further without actually crediting the creators of this fantastic setting and rule set, um, you have three classes essentially. You have your glaives, who are, if, uh, if we are forced to uh, use the D&D analogy, they are commonly your fighter types, but not necessarily just a man wandering around with a sword. They are your leaders, they are your combatants, they are those who stress might before other things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are just mindless brutes, far from it. They can be generals, they can be warlords, they can be the kinds of people that win the competitions for being the most handsome, because might can be exuded through more than just one sword arm. Uh, you have your nanos, who are especially gifted with using the Numenera, who I suppose are equivalents to your mages, your magic users. They are the ones probably most likely to splice themselves up with biomechanical upgrades, although glaives can certainly do the same thing. And then you have your jacks, who rather than just being jacks of all trades, just have almost complete freedom to specialise however they like. So certainly you can play your jack like a bard or a rogue, but you could also specialise him in any field in which you like. Character creation in this game is done in an interesting way, which has been pioneered by the by Monty Cook Games. It's a D20 system, but the character creation system is I am a... I want to get this exactly right. Um, I am an adjective noun who verbs. That is basically your character creation. I am an adjective noun who verbs. That's all you need to do. So as long as you've got a basic grip of uh, English, you should be fine. But to stress what that actually means, your adjective can come from a list. A list that will expand, I am sure, and hope I hope it does with further source books. Because if there's anything that's lacking in this game, it's that I want there to be more adjectives. Uh, it's your character descriptor that can be anything from charming to clever to rugged to strong to tough, and depending on what you pick, it will give you various bonuses to your pools and your edges, and give you various abilities in certain Numenera that you start out with. Um, so that is your adjective. Your noun is your glaive, your nano, or your jack. And again, that will focus your character in a certain way. And finally, your verb is your uh, your. 
focus. So we have a descriptor, we have your profession of a sort, and we finally have your we finally have your focus. The foci are well, I suppose the equivalent of your feats and largely your skills as well. They are special abilities that you will apply to your character at the start, and by all means they can change during the course of the game, because mutation is a very real possibility in Numenera. But your foci range from bears a halo of fire, to something as mundane as carries a quiver, to crafts illusions, to entertains, to fights with panache, to murders, to rages, to rides the lightning. So you could be a rugged nano who rides the lightning. You could be a charming glaive who controls beasts. You could be a deceitful jack who howls at the moon. And as well as those being descriptions that you can just use to roleplay with, it actually has an effect on your character's ability. So, for instance, using the foci as an example, let's say we have a character whose focus is um, controls gravity, which is one I particularly like. When you pick your focus, you have to pick how it connects. Well, you have to specify how it connects to another member of your party, because the connection between members of your group is vitally important. It actually encourages party play. And, for instance, controls gravity. I'll, I'll read the section for you. Gravity must have been quite a concern for the people of prior epochs, because there are so many parts within the Numenera to control it. Through a quirk of fate, some unique devices, or supreme devotion, you have learned to tap into the power of gravity. With one foot planted in the distant past, you are a mysterious individual, most likely or also older, having spent most of your life honing your odd ancient talents. You might prefer billowy garments that display your mastery of gravity's pull and conceal your identity and intentions. No one type of character is more likely to control gravity than another, but the power is rare. Your connection. Pick one other PC. In the recent past, while using your gravitational powers, you accidentally sent that character hurtling into the air or plummeting towards the ground. Either way, she barely survived. It is up to the player of that character to decide whether she resents, fears, or forgives you. You also gain a pen-sized oddity that we will reach, uh, reach later. And your abilities through these various foci go up to six tiers, just as your role in the party goes up to six tiers. There's only six levels, essentially. So this isn't a game you play to power gain to get as powerful as you possibly can. This is a game about discovery. And the powers that you get, they, um, well... Let's say they multiply swiftly. So, controls gravity at tier 1, you can hover. Tier 2, you can lessen grav gravity's pull. Let's go up to tier 5, you can fly. Tier 6, weight of the world. You can increase a target's weight dramatically. The target's pulled to the ground and can't move physically under its own power for one minute. Um, so... You can see it's almost like magic, but it's all innate. It's really quite an interesting system. The system itself works off a D20 basis, and it isn't as simple as just adding your skills or adding your combat attack bonus or anything like that. It's simpler. Quite frankly, well, quite simply, you have your three abilities. You have might, speed, and intellect. That's it. That's all you have. And you have a pool for each of these. Now, each sort of class has a focus. So, for instance, a glaive is more likely to have more points in might, and nano is more likely to have more points in intellect. And the jack can be anywhere they want to be. Now, when you go to roll a d20 against a difficulty, difficulty comes in levels. So, for instance, and it's always three times the level is what you're rolling against. So, a level three difficulty is a 9. You need to score higher than a 9 on a roll of d20. Okay, odds are currently in your favour. You can make them even further in your favour by spending points from your pool. So let's say you have a pool of 9 in might. It won't be replenished automatically, but you could spend 3 of those pool in order to augment your dice roll. You add 3 to your d20, roll it. So previously, if you'd scored an 8, you would have failed. Now, as you've added 3, you would succeed. You augment your roll before rolling it as a point of reference. Also, you can have edges. Edges reduce the cost of contributing pool. So, for instance, an edge of one will reduce the cost by one, if you see what I mean. It's a really remarkable system. It is really quite simple. There's certain commonalities with the uh, prose descriptive quality system as well, I find. But, in general, I think it's just 
a really good system that serves the setting very, very well. It's simple, I found that people have managed to get their heads around it without having played the game before, straight away. No difficulty at all. Now, the book itself is divided into just under 30 chapters that comprise, of course, character creation, rules, um, GM's advice, and so on. The setting is, I would consider, the, the, to be the strength of around 100 pages in length, and the source books contribute to that. I look forward to getting more and more of them, to be honest. Um, the bestiary as well, and... Sorry, I will. I would like to mention before I go further because in my reviews, one of the things I very rarely do is give all credit that is due to the artists. And the artists in this game, of which there are many, um, uh, have done a magnificent job. And rather than read out every single name, I am going to hold up the artist page, and I hope that you can read it because the artists who have contributed to this role-playing game have grabbed my imagination with their artwork, you know, augmenting, of course, the uh, the fantastic literature within. So, well done, I have to say. Um, it's really done a good job. The Bestiary. The Bestiary, um, which runs for, I believe, about 50 pages. Um, I'm going to check that now. I would hate to uh, mislead you. Um, it runs for 40 pages, and um, it also contains non-player characters beyond that, so if you just need someone to throw into a game, a quick bandit, a quick nano, a quick glaive, a quick warlord or tyrant, or something of that ilk, or a mutant or an abhuman, there is a whole list of them there. The monsters, um, or beasts, of the Ninth World range from the vaguely unthreatening, is thin, through to the absolutely terrifying Erinth Gran, a Grask. You, uh, I'm not doing them justice, but hopefully that's enough incentive to actually buy the thing. Um, through to the absolutely thought-provoking um, creativity uh, producing Nibovian wife, of whom I'm going to read. These biological constructs appear to be beautiful female humans. Their only function, however, is to seduce male humans so they can get pregnant. Pregnancy in an Abovian wife opens a trans-dimensional rift inside its womb, giving an ultra-terrestrial, uh, such as an Abacos or an Errant Grask or any other ultra-terrestrial creature the GM wishes, access to this level of existence. The time required for gestation, which is actually the aligning of phase changes to create the rift, ranges from 10 minutes to 9 months. When the ultra-terrestrial creature is born, the Nabovian wife nurtures it as if it were a child, even though it clearly is not. Um, it goes on. What a unique idea for a monster. Uh, completely out of left field. You would never see something like that in D&D. And I have to say, D&D 5 is going to have to pull a hell of a lot out of somewhere in order to beat this game for me. Numenera is immense. It is fantastic. I'll just show you some more of the art of the beasts of this bestiary. Um, my favourite uh, double page, actually, the Sathosh and the Scuttermorph. Um, the Sathosh, just because, or Sathosh, just because they look, I don't know how well you will be able to see that, they look frightening. Uh, they are sort of tentacle-headed abhumans, and uh, the Scuttermorph, this is what happens when you've got a light on your camera, which is like a giant millipede that circles trees and uh, other vertical structures. Um, again, utterly bizarre. I, I love this. I really do. And thank you to Monty Cook and Monty Cook Games and Shauna for putting this together. Um... How does the Numenera work in this game? Well, it comes in three forms, typically, beyond the massive structures. Uh, you've got ciphers, which are one-shot items, uh, such as uh, detonators that may detonate webs, they may detonate corrosive effects, fire, that kind of thing. Um, you have uh, sort of teleporters that you could hit someone with it and they'll just disappear somewhere else in the ninth world. Um, but once you use it, they're gone. They're quite powerful. You can often start the game with them, but one use and they're done. Um, 
there's a great market in the ninth world for people that can potentially create ciphers because they are the kinds of things that can turn the tides of battle. Slightly less powerful but with more uses, artifacts. They are, I suppose, comparable to your wands, to your magical items in uh, in D&D. That can be everything from, let's see, breathers that will allow you to uh, breathe in uh, inhospitable environments. And believe me, there are plenty of them in this game. And radiation is a, is a reality. It will make your teeth uh, glow white, but it will also make your skin drop off. Um, the artifacts, there's a very interesting list, but to be honest, what I want to get onto is the oddities. The oddities, as I said before... They're, they're something that remind me very strongly of Stalker. Not all of them seem to be useful, but in the right circumstances, they could be a game changer. For instance, you can roll D100, and uh, there's a whole load of different oddities here. Well, 100. Um, a mummified fish with feathered wings in a wooden box. A two-headed cat fetus in a glass jar. A pair of small floating cubes that keep a small enclosed room at the temperature at which water freezes. Okay, we're seeing more use here. Scarf that appears to be made of silk but is virtually indestructible and cannot be dirtied or stained. Um, a wristband that buzzes when in complete darkness. A hoop that sharpens any blade that passes through it. These oddities, they are very much like those, uh, the pin cushion, I'm trying to remember the names of the things now, the pinwheel, and so on from Stalker, but they really fit the setting and the wonder that your characters will exhibit when finding one of these things. The uh, game of Numenera that I ran was actually the intro scenario. Uh, there's three scenarios in this book, um, so three ways to get your game started. And um, actually, no, you know what? There's five, uh, four, sorry. Uh, I ran the Beal of Borregal, and it's a perfectly good opening scenario. And the reason why I find that noteworthy, the reason I mention it, is because I never run adventures from books. I always run my own adventure. I always come up with my own thing. Uh, whether it's for Planescape, Forgotten Realms, Vampire... I buy these damn things and I read them and I take ideas from them, but I never run them from the book. I think it's testament to a well-written adventure that I read it and I want to run it. So, where are we? Well, we're nearly the, at the end of the book and nearly at the end of a half-hour review, which I must apologise for the length of, but I hope that my enthusiasm for this game is in some way contagious, because Numenera is a game unlike any other, in my mind, for the genre that it fits in, and I would say it expands that genre. It leaves me, after this 28 minutes nearly, speechless. I cannot sing enough praises about this game, and I'm not even on commission. <laughs> wow, yeah. So... My final thoughts on Numenera, well, it's, uh, let's see, I want to count the pages. Um, it's over 400 pages of utter luxury. Even if you don't play it, even if you don't run it, you will enjoy reading it. You've got a full map in the back. Hopefully you'll be able to pick up a print version to, uh, in order to get that. If not, you can download it on DriveThruRPG. And I believe you can order the print version from Monty Cook Games' uh, website. Hopefully it will re be released on print on demand. I really do hope so through Drive for RPG because that's where I typically get my role-playing games and I would very much like a print copy of the best, Yuri. That is the only weakness. The only weakness of this game. I must find a criticism. I have to find a criticism of everything that I review. I would love for the bestiary to be expanded, and I know it has been, I know there is a separate source book for the bestiary, uh, but in this book I didn't find 40 pages of beasts enough, I would have liked to have seen more, and the truth is if I pick through the entire setting I could find those beasts because they're all described as part of the setting, they're just not all put into the bestiary part, so, and it's so easy to make creatures for this. I say so easy, there's so much imagination that's gone into a lot of them. But you can really bounce off the ideas that are already presented and come up with some wonderful and shocking uh, bastards for your characters to come up against. 
Um, I know, I've done it. So, I don't think there's much else to say, except thank you very much to Monty Cook Games for creating Numenera, because I have a new favourite of the fantasy, fantasy, fantasy I, I'm shouting in Sean Connery, I have a new, new favourite of the fantasy genre, and must thank you uh, for creating it, because it has been an absolute joy reading it, an absolute joy running it, and I do hope at some point I get to play it. Thank you very much for watching.